Here's what I would like to do this morning is we're about to really start this amazing section in Peter. Turn to 1 Peter where we're going to continue our study in chapter 5. And really at the heart of chapter 5, Peter is going to drive home. I think the theme of his epistle is this living hope that we've been born again to. And I'm going to tie all that in as we finish looking you know, at the details of chapter 5. And, and I'll sum up the whole epistle here in a few weeks. But narrowing in, this section is really dealing with pride and humility. And I I preached a sermon, I think it's been 15 years ago on this subject after reading a pamphlet by Stuart Scott, who's over at Southern Seminary now. And I just just want to bring that up again and work through that. I'm going to kind of give you a broad brush uh, to really to examine and prepare our hearts uh, for the scalpel in these next few sections. There, there is so much beauty in these verses that Peter's going to tie together with pride and humility. And so next week, we'll, we'll set the context and how it all flows together. Uh, in verse 6, we have a therefore, this great logical argument that's going to go on and could set us free in some beautiful ways in connecting verse 7 with anxiety. So next week, I hope to show you uh, how pride and anxiety work together and how you could be set free in dealing with your pride, even in your anxiety. So a, a neat connection that Peter makes. But this morning, then, will be almost a topical sermon to lay this foundation for the next few weeks. So I would like to examine pride and humility this morning. I'm just praying that the fruit would be that God would expose our pride and break it and produce the fruit of humility. That humility would be the aroma of Southside Bible Church and not like the air that we breathe daily uh, of just unadulterated pride. The, the, the spirit of the age we live in is just pride. And so I want you to come to a church and step in here this morning and feel a deep, deep love for God and each other and this a sense of humility. And John Piper defined humility in my favorite definition, Jesus is all. It's not, I'm a nobody. It's that Jesus Christ is everything. I'm just done with all thinking about me at all. And humility is just, all I can think about is Christ. I just want him put on display. I preach nothing but him. I think of nothing but Christ. If I live, to me to live is Christ. And to die will be more of Christ. So humility is someone who's just taken up with Christ. And you don't even matter anymore. I just love Christ and his glory and putting it on display. That is where we're going uh, with our humility. And so what I would like to start then is pray because there's nothing natural that can produce that. This is only going to be done supernaturally. You will never be able to produce humility in your life. You work at it and all will come out is more pride. Strive to overcome sin in your power and it will exalt pride. And so we need to come before our God this morning and ask him then that he'll bring this chief grace of humility into our lives and mortify this awful sin of pride that is really the root of every sin. First sin of the universe with with the devil wanting to be like God, Adam and Eve wanting to be like God. It is the, the root foundational sin and core of everyone of our beings. And so we need to be delivered as these five testimonies just shared of the bondage of pride unto this humility of sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and now learning how to live at that beautiful place, the feet of Christ. So let's go to this sweet Savior, our beautiful God, and pray. Father, I thank you for a glorious morning. I rejoice that you're a saving God. Uh, Those five brought so much joy to my heart of how good and merciful you are. We we heard of testimonies of self-righteousness, testimonies of plundering into sin. God, you delivered, and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for this section in Peter, and I pray that even this morning that your spirit would, would move us away from pride and move us more to this beautiful grace of humility. God, we ask now that you would do for us what we cannot do in our own strength. I pray that it would be your Holy Spirit uh, leading us into this beautiful fruit. God, I pray that you would cause this to abound in all the lives in this room, even here this morning. So please, God, meet us in a special way and produce this so that you would get all the glory. We do pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So... 
Uh, just a few comments. If you'll look with me, where we left off last time we were together was in verse 5. We, we began uh, looking at elders and the humility and the kindness and the way elders should shepherd the flock of God. And now he moves in verse 5 and he begins, really the first word is likewise. Likewise, the way that shepherds are to be humble with their flock and to, to not do this for sordid gain, but to be examples. Likewise, you younger men. Why, why would he pick out the younger men uh, at such a time in this epistle? And I, I'm not really all the way sure, but maybe you struggle a little bit, young men, with haughtiness. Uh, young men kind of knowing all the right answers and the right ways to do everything. And so Peter's now going to turn and say, young men, I, I want you to be submissive to these men who you've put over you as elders to shepherd the flock of God. They can't shepherd you if you won't come underneath their oversight and their wisdom and what they've gained in life to help you not make all the same mistakes, to help you grow up into the image of Christ. But before I I go any further. I just want to start with the young men in this church are unbelievable. I see the grace of God. I get to work with you guys on a constant basis. And what I have experienced is humility. And I've experienced a submission to oversight and to help. And so I, I just want you guys to realize you, you don't fit the norm of the day. And so I give God all the glory, but I want you to be encouraged with the way you have come under oversight to be discipled and mentored and overseen. So younger men, uh, Peter says, I want you to be submissive. It's hupotasso, it's a Greek word, it's a military term to rank under, and it's an imperative, it's a command. I'm commanding you, young men, to be submissive then to these leaders, to, to come out. It's, it's an aorist, which would kind of have this completed action. It, it's make your mind up. Don't make it up every time something comes. Do I want to listen to this or not? It's, it's a settled uh, before God, I'm bringing myself under God and under this leadership. So it's good for young children. You, you make your mind up. It isn't a, a, if dad says something I like or don't like, I, I'm under the authority. I come under it. I come under a husband. All of the things we've been learning in Peter of submission, here it is. It, it's, it's make your mind up before God that I will live in submission to authority. And that's the way we've learned. We're going to put the gospel on display throughout Peter as we submit to difficult governments and bosses and all of that area. So here it is, more submission. Young men, come under. Be submissive. And then he says in verse 5, not only that, all of you. This is the whole congregation. Not just the young men, but all of you. What he's commanding here at the close of this epistle is clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Put on this garment of humility toward each other. Here's the chief grace. We, we've seen him say, have a stretching agape love, but now I want you to all be characterized by humility. The, the, the aroma of a church should be humility. If we've seen who we are before God and what he's done in Christ, every one of us should be a humble people. Every one of us, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be King Tut any longer. It shouldn't be this life is about in, through, and to me. Everything's about me. It should be, it's in the proper place now. God is, he's the supreme and I'm under this and I serve other people. I'm clothed in a humility. And what difference does that make if I do that? What's the big deal? Who cares if I'm a little bit prideful? Well, I want you to look at verse 5, and there's a beautiful answer to that. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This is in the present tense. God is continuously opposed. The Greek word is, I stand in battle array against those who are prideful. The, the living God stands present tense against those who are prideful. I, some of you might be saying, why am I not growing the way that I should? I'll tell you right now, you need grace. You can do nothing in the Christian life apart from the grace of God. And he's telling you right now, if you stand here in all of your haughtiness and pride, the grace of God is against you. <laughs> he's standing in battle array to take you down, to put you in the right position where you belong before God. So he, he's, it's against you. But his grace he gives to the humble. So for the humble of heart, his grace flows. The ones who say, apart from you, I can do nothing. 
The one who realizes I, I can't accomplish anything. I can't do anything we've learned in Peter apart from the grace of God. This is where every Christian must be brought to this brokenness that I need the grace of God. And then it flows. Humility, the grace of God will flow through you to do things that you could never do in your own strength and in your own power. The grace of God flows through the humble of heart. Could this be why you're not growing the way you want? And so what a, what a powerful section then that he introduces is that we're all to be clothed with humility and how we deal with each other and how we think about ourselves and what this world is all about. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I want to expose then pride. And I can't remember the number. I got it somewhere in here. I, I got like 29 examples of pride and like 19 examples of humility. And so what I would like to do is by looking at it, because pride is really happy for, for you to take the front seat while it takes the back seat. I, I've said before, pride is like bad breath. Everybody knows you have it but you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and so most of us will be saying, yeah, God's opposed to the proud like the guy next to me. And so what I want to do is I want to try to undress your pride. And I want you to look it right in the face this morning and realize you're full of it. You have pride, you're coming out. And so God's opposed to it. And I really, I, my goal is to, so, so you'll say, I'm the man. That's who I am. And then I want you to look at the glories of humility and say, God, could I become that person? And then we'll jump back into Peter next week and start seeing how he's going to unflow it. Uh, so I, I really just want you this morning let the Spirit of God work on you. Don't think about your parents, your kids, your neighbor, your best. I, I just want you. I, I, I want every one of us now before God to let him uh, deal with our hearts to see, am I growing in pride or humility? What characterizes my life? So pride has six Hebrew words. If I had to just summarize it, it's this idea of lifting up or a highness kind of a, thinking of yourself highly, uh, lifting yourself up uh, to put yourself on display instead of God. Uh, two categories in the Greek, one meant straining or stretching one's neck to magnify or to be haughty. I'm straining to magnify myself. The other word is blindness, uh, to be enveloped with smoke. High thinking is blindness. It, it's you're lost in darkness and blindness and pride and you, you, you have yourself in all the wrong place. You, you're the sun and everything revolves around you. That is darkness. That's blindness that we all are born into this world with. Chuck Swindoll said the world's smallest package is a man wrapped up in himself. Baxter said it better. He said pride is so undiscerned by most that it's commonly cherished while it's commonly spoke against. So I can speak against it while I cherish it in my own heart. So I'm gonna to try to throw out a definition. I, I think I've got a slide on it maybe. I, I, I threw some slides, this is kinda of out of my comfort zone. So what do you guys think? Good job, Pastor. Thanks, Timmy. The definition. The mindset of self. I like the bracket. It's a master's mindset rather than that of a servant. So it's more on the master rather than a servant. It's a focus on self and the service of self. It's a desire to control and use all things for self. This is the way we come into this world. Self is the center reference point. So it really is, instead of Romans eleven thirty six, from from me, through me, and to me are all things. Thomas Watson said, pride seeks to ungod God. It's to make you God. Our pride wants us to sit at the throne and know what's right, how to run our lives. We want to ungod God and we want to be in that position. So to sum it up, it's a person who believes that life is all about them. Life is all about my happiness, my accomplishments, my self-worth. My favorite subject is self. That's what this has done to us, the fall. And we come into this world, little babies already crying and just wanting our own way. Self is the center reference point, And there is our deep, deep problem. So let's look at 
pride. I want to look at some characteristics. The first one, and these slides are so if you want to take notes or even pull out your phones and take a picture of them, I'm going to move quickly because I don't have much time. First, pride will be one who complains against or passes judgment on God. I'm the one who who tells God if he's running his universe or my life correctly. I look at all that God has done to me and all that I have done for him and he owes me. uh, You see it throughout the Old Testament. And trial is when I see this come the most and it comes out that I've been good, I've done these things. Why is God doing this to me? And our pride will so quickly turn to tell God what he needs to do in running my life. A second manifestation of pride is a lack of gratitude in general. Uh, The prideful heart is usually an ungrateful heart. Prideful people think they deserve what is good. I deserve all of these things. And so Romans 1 says the fallenness of humanity is that you don't give God thanks. That's how we know we're fallen is that we don't glorify God and we don't give him thanks. We don't live in this state of you just, I give you thanks that I can even breathe and am walking this morning. Some of you have been through some horrific things and I want you to see that, that the right place is to come and give God thanks for who he is and what he has done. A prideful person, you never have or you can never get enough. You're critical and you complain and you're discontent. You just have a lack of gratitude in general. A third manifestation is that of anger. This can include outbursts of anger. It could be you withdraw from people, you pout, or you're frustrated. It's just a pride that when it doesn't get its way, what comes out is anger. Our rights or our expectations are not being met. And here again is that center reference point. And so the response is anger when I can't control everyone else and how they treat me. Fourthly, pride is seeing yourself as better than other people. You're always looking down. We just heard in some testimonies, sneering and looking down upon other people. You're easily disgusted and little tolerance for people who are different. It'll, be, it'll manifest itself in bigotry in different areas like that. I think of the, the, the woman who walked into Jesus with all the Pharisees to wash his feet with her tears, and they're looking at her with such disdain, going, he can't be a prophet. You know, just that whole looking down and despising this woman who will walk away with the grace of God. Fifth, having an inflated view of your importance, your gifts, and your abilities. I, 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 I'm God's gift to the church. Uh, everything should revolve around me. And all I can think about is how important I am. You are a legend in your own mind. You've got it figured out. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, what do you have that you did not receive? There's instant humility is that everything that I have has been given from God. And so I'm not God's gift to the world or to the church. Everything I have, I look at in humility. It's given to serve the body of Christ and to build it up. Number six, it's being focused on the lack of your gifts and your abilities. This might actually look like humility. Oh, I'm just a nobody. I don't have any gifts, and that's actually a pride. It's Romans 12 says you need to have a right assessment of your gifts. Don't think too highly and don't think too lowly where you never serve the body because you're, I, I just really can't give anything. I have nothing to offer. It's, it's a pride. It's a pride that looks at you instead of the God who has put these gifts within you. It's a focus on self while others need to be served. Number seven, this is an interesting one, perfectionism. Perfectionism is a form of pride. You do it sometimes for recognition, sometimes just to feel good about yourself, that I I live to this high perfect standard that I have. Uh, sometimes making things less important that aren't that important as a perfectionist. You get so lost in things that, that you're, you're, you're not serving others because of your high standard that you're always trying to achieve. The Pharisees were straining gnats and swallowing camels, and sometimes perfectionists can strain gnats and swallow camels while they're too busy keeping their high standard versus loving and serving the body of Christ. Enough arrows or should I keep going? <laughs> Uh, talking 
too much. What I have to say is more important than what you have to say. Prideful people are usually very bad listeners. Proverbs 10, 19 says, where there's many words, there's sure to be transgression. And so, some, you know, something to just pray about. How will I ever be able to minister to others if I'm the one always talking? And so, a good listener will be one we'll see has humility. Pride, number nine, talking too much about yourself. Sometimes you can just talk too much, and other times you can just talk too much about yourself. Your favorite subject is you. I have so much pleasure sharing about me. That's my joy. And so it's a, it's a pride that all you can do is talk about yourself. Number 10, seeking independence or control. These are the people that a lot of times you have to be self-employed because you can't work for anyone else. I don't need anyone. Surely in this context, I don't need an elder. Uh, you're rigid and stubborn and headstrong and intimidating. It's my way or the highway. And instead, in Ephesians and Peter, we've learned that we should be submissive to all. Number 11, the manifestation of pride is being consumed with what other people think. I love what Paul said in Galatians 1. He said, if I was still worried about what people thought, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. If that was my concern any longer, I wouldn't be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm done with that. And so someone who's prideful, you live in this state of always worrying what other people think. Half of what you do is because of what other people will think. And the gospel, humility, can set you free from the bondage of just living into what do other people think. It's a pride where you're, all you're stuck is on yourself. And I can only think about what is everyone else thinking about me? Number 12 being devastated or angered by criticism. You'll, you'll find really, if you're prideful, no one can confront you or you're undone or you blow up back to anger. And so you just, you can't receive criticism. Proud people struggle with it. They can't accept who they really are. I can pray and pour my heart out to God about my sin and say I'm so awful, but if someone else says it, I, I can't handle it. I come undone. Some of you just sitting here, is that you? No one can confront me. No one can say anything to, to help me grow as a Christian without me just being undone. It's, an, it's a, a pride, and you'll never be able to grow with that. Number 13, being unteachable. You're, you're a know-it-all, and no one can ever teach you or instruct you or help you or guide you. And every time someone tries, yeah, yeah, I already know that. I've, you know, humility receives the word. James 1, it says, receive the word with humility. And so pride is someone you really are, you're unteachable. And you sit in the judgment seat of everyone else who teaches. Number 14, a prideful man, woman, or child is sarcastic, hurtful, or degrading. You'll, you'll just use sarcasm to tear and hurt people and degrade them. And why are you doing that? Why? Proud people can be the most unkind people because you're belittling people to raise yourself up. I, I, if I can put them down, I don't have to feel bad about myself. And so we'll spend all of our days making sure we keep everybody else with their nose being rubbed in the ground instead of uh, humility where we'll go next. Fifteen, a proud, prideful person will have a lack of service. They don't think about other people. They're just too caught up in your own problems. The gospel can set you free from the bondage of only thinking about yourself. And all of a sudden, you can have a self-forgetfulness. What could be more blessed than self-forgetfulness? What, what a beautiful thing. Instead of just always being lost in yourself, and is everyone serving me enough that the gospel can set you free to just lose it and serve for other people the rest of your days? Number 16 is you'll, then you'll have a lack of compassion. I find that prideful people have a lack of compassion because they can't see beyond their own desires. They can't get past it. Uh, I could handle that. What a big baby. What's the big deal? And you just, you're just so caught up in how good you are and how well you can handle everything. You never can enter into anyone else's hurt. You can never feel what they're feeling because you're just insensitive and all about yourself. 17. Are we doing good with the slides? Man, I'm going to do this every week. <laughs> 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 
being defensive or blame shifting. So you're going to be very defensive and you'll always shift the blame. What about you, Mr. Log? What is it? Log grabbing my splinter? Why don't you go deal with your log? And you're, you're always going to be defensive and you're always going to blame shift. It, it's not me. It's the, the way I was raised. My parents did this to me. I was a thumb sucker and that's why I act this way. And you're going to just be moving and shifting everything around and spend all of your days blame shifting instead of dealing with who you really are before God which is what your judgment day will be like. So I encourage you to do it now uh, rather than later. Number 18, a lack of admitting when you're wrong. Did anyone ever watch Happy Days? The Fonz, I was, he he could never say he was wrong. I see that. I, I, I can't admit it. I was tired. I was just having a bad day. If you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done that. Or I'm sorry for responding wrongly to how rude you were. (laughs) We just won't deal with it. And someone who's prideful can't just own up to their sin and who they are. And that leads to number 19. You'll have a lack of forgiveness. You're just someone who just can't forgive easily. I live in the forgiveness of God. It is very easy to forgive when you realize how much you've been forgiven. And so a prideful person is someone, because you're so elevated in your own mind, you don't grant forgiveness easily. So a good test for you this morning is, how easily do you grant forgiveness? Does it flow easy or is it like pulling teeth for you? You can't humble yourselves and admit you're wrong. And I'll tell you right now, that destroys children as a parent. That will destroy them if you can't admit wrong and forgive. It will, usually you'll, you'll pull the old, I'll just be nice to them instead of owning what I really have done and what I am. And, and pride, number 20, brings about a lack of biblical prayer. I've never met a prideful person ever who has a good prayer life. You will not pray because you can do it all on your own sufficiency. You're confident that you know, you, you're, you're quick, you think quick, you, you've always been able to get yourself out of every situation. But, but the, the humble one will be quick to turn to, to God. They live in a dependency. And so pr- a prideful person will have a very weak, shallow prayer life. And then, but if you do, when you do pray, what will it be centered on? Oh God, help me, give me this, give me that, give me... It'll be very self-centered. All of your prayers will just be on you. 21, voicing preferences or opinions when not asked. I I like preferences and I like opinions, but not when they're not asked for all the time. (laughs) I got an opinion about everything. Well, this is what I believe and you need to hear me out. And you spend all of your life letting everyone know what you think about everything and very few people want to know what you think about everything. 22, minimize your sin and your shortcomings and maximize others. You know, it just, it's always that, I just have a struggle but what you have is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that, you have a big old log. And so we'll, we'll always just be quick to, to, to give ourselves a lot of grace and give none to anyone else with what they struggle with and, and where they're at. Number 23, <clears throat> I gotta speed up. Be impatient and irritable with others. My plans are being ruined, so I am frustrated, and I'm always impatient, and and everyone else isn't fitting into my life and how I want it run. 24, you're jealous. You have a hard time being glad when anyone else is blessed and finds success. A great test is in your own family. How do you do when a sibling outdoes you, gets more praise or honor? Just are you, can you rejoice with other people when they're blessed? And can you weep with them when they weep? <clears throat> 25, you will use other people. Everyone is utilitarian. You are how you can serve me. What can you do for me? I come to church because I need some friends. I need for what you can do for me. What have you done for me lately will be your motto. 26, you will cover up sins and faults and mistakes. You will always 
cover. Some people will do anything to keep from letting people know your weaknesses. And you'll never grow in the body of Christ if you can't open up your weaknesses and let brothers and sisters help you grow and get. So it, to hide all of your sin and weaknesses and smile like you're the Apostle Paul when you're not is never going to help you or grow you, and it's pride. 27. You will use attention getting tactics. <laughs> You'll dress crazy. You'll, you'll just be bizarre. You'll be rebellious. You'll, you'll always be talking about your problems. You're, you just, all you want is attention and you'll, be, you'll do anything crazy to get it. 28, you will not have close relationships. I've never met anyone prideful who has deep, intimate relationships. You ruin them. You ruin marriages. You ruin your kids. You, you ruin relationships because of your pride and you just keep hurting them. The trouble outweighs the benefits for you with people. Or you're so self-sufficient, you really don't need anyone else. I'm the Lone Ranger and I don't need Tonto. Don't forsake the assembling together as will become the habit of some. So I encourage you, pride keeps you from intimate, close relationships. And the list can go on, flatters, materialistic, uh, just, it, it, I'll stop. Does anyone need more? I'm willing. Come see me afterwards. Right now, pride is not letting you feel the blow of this. And I want you to come back to our text. God is opposed to the proud. Don't take that lightly. God is opposed to the one who stands in this kind of pride and just stands defiantly. Proverbs 6 says there's six things that the Lord hates that are an abomination, and he starts with pride in that list. This is what will characterize all of those in hell and why they went there because of pride. They would never humble themselves at the feet of Jesus Christ and their pride will just ooze and grow for all of eternity. Pride. Next slide, humility. Humility can only come through the Spirit of God. This cannot be produced naturally and we must put this on daily. An unbeliever cannot be humble. He can fake it, but he cannot be truly humble. And this word is several Old Testament terms. And for humble, it referred to the action of bowing low or crouching down to do this in heart. It's a lowliness of heart. The New Testament has two words. The one is servile or base. The other was gentle or meek or yielding to God. And the best example of humility that we will ever find is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, come to me for I'm what? How can you come to the eternal God? Well, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. Philippians 2, he didn't consider a thing, a quality with God to be grasped, but he emptied himself and he took on the form of a bondservant. He went to the point of death, even on a cross. And the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He stooped so low to serve mankind and to lead us to to life out of death. Christ is our true example. And so my definition uh, is someone then focused on loving God and others. It's a pretty simple definition. Humility is now, because I've been born again, my life, my very core being, my center reference point is I'm going to love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength and my neighbor as myself. So someone who is humble is not the guy ducking his head saying, I'm a nobody, I'm not good for anything, but it's someone who just says, I love God and I love other people. And so I've been born again to this love that he talked about in chapter 1. And so humility is I just, I want to love God with all of my being and I want to love other people. That's how I know I've been born again. I've been made alive and been set free from the bondage of loving self and making that just stuck by nature, always looking to yourself. There's a hangover that we all have, but at the core of our being, our new birth, our new being is one now from the heart that loves God and loves other people. That's my definition of humility. Service to others for God's glory not to be recognized. I just want God glorified. No need to elevate self because I have God's love and God's forgiveness. Our goal is to elevate God and to encourage and build other people up. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 15, it says, He died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You've been saved to quit living for yourself so that you can now live for God. What a blessed freedom we've been set free to. Isn't that bigger than just hanging your head, looking morose and saying you're nothing? I want to set you free from that. That's pride. I want to set you free. That's looking at yourself instead of what God can do through you. That's a pride. Rather than just being genuinely wanting God's name glorified and other people built up into the head. That's freedom and that's humility. And I'm going to look real quickly. These ones, the slide guy, uh, we're going to just go so quick through them, but I just want you to just take them in for, for what God can do in our hearts quickly. First, someone who's humble then recognizes and trusts God's character. He's so familiar with God and his attributes that he can trust them even in trial. This is humility. I know God and I can trust him no matter what he brings into my life. I walked up to Ray and Sammy at the conference as she finds out uh, she's got cancer and all I got was glory to God, trust. She, they have ironed out their faith in who God is and it's sufficient for them now. That is humility. I trust the character of God in everything that he brings into my life. Secondly, seeing yourself as having no right to question or judge an almighty and perfect God. I can't question infinite perfection. Humility acknowledges that. He's God. I'm not. I don't question that. Uh, I, the little uh, anthropos doesn't say to Theos, what are you doing? Potter, you have no right to make me this way. We stop that. And we look at, we look at Theos. And we don't question. And we worship. Thirdly, we focus on Christ. For me to live is Christ. Humility gazes and looks at, I get all things through Christ. He is, he's everything. He's my vine and I'm a branch. Branches don't boast. They get everything from a vine. Humility is, I just look at Christ. Fourth, you'll have biblical praying. You'll be totally dependent on his enablement. John Owen, the Puritan, said, we can have no power from Christ unless we live in a persuasion that we have none of our own. <laughs> Humility, I have none of my own. Number five, being overwhelmed with God's undeserved grace and goodness. I deserve hell and I've been forgiven for so much. I live in that state. I'm just overwhelmed with the grace and goodness of God of what I have in Jesus Christ and what I have for all of eternity that we've been learning in 1 Peter. Number six, being thankful and grateful in general towards others. I don't expect anything and I'm just grateful for anything that I get from anybody at all. I don't sit and count everything that people haven't done for me. I just sit and appreciate everything they've done for me. Number seven, be gentle and patient. You're willing to wait and you're not easily irritated. Number eight, seeing yourself as no better than others, but for the grace of God, there go I. Number nine, I said it before, you will be a good listener. Number 10, you'll be gladly submissive to those in authority because of the humility that you submit to God. Number 11, you'll be thankful for criticism or reproof. Reprove a fool and he'll hate you. Reprove a wise man and he'll love you. Number 12, you'll have a teachable spirit. I don't know everything. God, you could use a donkey to teach me. God, sometimes God preaches to me through a flower. <laughs> have a teachable spirit. Number 13, seek always to build up others. I just, all I want to do is build up others into the image of Jesus Christ. Serving, number 14, looking for ways how you could serve and assist other people. Your eyes will look that way. And 15, you'll be quick to admit when wrong and ask forgiveness. Don't give all your excuses. I was r r wrong and I asked for forgiveness. Number 16, repenting of sin is a way of life. And it looks toward real change. 
17, you'll minimize others' sins and shortcomings in light of your own. Number 18, you'll be genuinely glad for other people. And 19, you'll possess close relationships because you'll love others and you'll know your need for other relationships. And because it's not all about me, I can actually overcome just the fear of the whole thing. And so if I live in humility, I'm gonna draw near to others and I'm gonna draw near to the body causing the growth of the body so that we can become the head. And so I pray that this introduction now will will guide us uh, next week. If the Lord doesn't come back and we're all still alive, I'll stand up here again if if the Lord so wills. So I'm gonna close with two verses and we'll pray. Uh, If Lorenzo and Ray are here while I'm praying, I'm gonna ask you guys to come up. We wanna pray for you guys before you get married this weekend. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And then in a few chapters later, Isaiah 66, verse 1, thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and the one who trembles at my word. And so next week we'll look at how do we grow in humility and move from pride. And if you've walked in here this morning, the Bible says that your pride is you'll look to anything else to get you right with God. You'll keep trying. You came even to church maybe this morning to try to make yourself right with God. And the bottom line is, is that you gotta come to humility. You gotta quit thinking that there's anything that you can do that can get you right with God. And God sent his son into this world to do everything necessary so that you could be made right with God. And his son went up on a cross and our sins were placed upon him and he was pierced through for our transgressions. And then he lived the life that you should have. He obeyed the law perfectly. And by that, God will put that to your account. And there's a way now to have your sins forgiven and to be wrapped in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and to stand before God blameless and accepted. And he will forgive you and it says he will adopt you into his family. And so I pray that you'll put down your pride and today you would come to Jesus Christ in humility and look for him to save and what you can't do with your own hand. And so I offer to you this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so come to him, even if your pride has been at church for 30 years and you've never come to Christ, Put down any pride and come to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this uh, beauty of your word. And I pray, Lord, that in every one of us that pride has been exposed. And I pray now, Lord, the only way to get rid of it is at the feet of Jesus Christ and seeing him in all of his beauty, the spirit of God manifesting him and showing us that beauty, the spirit of God producing from within this wonderful, beautiful humility that is a God-given trait. God, would you produce that in every one of your children here, that we would be growing and moving in this direction, that, that together in community we'll help each other become more humble. God, thank you for this beautiful grace, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.